The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. And Signal Gasoline is tops, too. Tops in quality. It takes extra quality, you know, to give you extra mileage. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal Circle sign in yellow and black that identifies friendly dealer-owned Signal stations from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story. Quiet Suicide. It was in a drab room in a commercial hotel in Chicago that Frank Reynolds finally made up his mind. And in a curious way, it was quite appropriate that the decision should come to him there. Partway between Los Angeles and New York. Partway between two lives. He'd known from the first, of course, that a showdown was inevitable sooner or later. But as time went on, he began to recognize the desperate form the showdown would take. He came to realize that the only way out was murder. The train tickets were in his pocket. His bags were packed, ready to go when he picked up the phone. Operator. This is Mr. Reynolds in room 617. I'd like to call New York. Mrs. Frank Reynolds. Long Island, 89038. Thank you, sir. One moment, please. Right. Long distance. I'm calling Long Island, New York. Is this Mr. Frank Reynolds? Yes, that's right. I have a call for you from Los Angeles, Mr. Reynolds. Los Angeles? I, look, I'm calling New York. Go ahead, Los Angeles. Just a Angeles. moment, operator. I t- Frank. Millicent, how did you... Darling, I had to call you. I knew you'd be staying there. And I, oh, I I'm just... sorry, Millie. I can't talk now. My train leaves Frank, in a few you've minutes. Frank, you've got to tell me the truth. I can't stand it any longer. What's the matter, dear? You're running off that way, not even saying goodbye. Oh, darling, I told you I had to rush off. About that, that business deal in New York. But it's more than that. Isn't it, darling? What do you mean, Millie? Tell me, Frank, you've got to be fair with me. If it's another woman, I... Another woman? It's on my mind all the time. I can't eat, I can't sleep, Listen, Millicent, I I told you a hundred times. There's no other woman, dear. No one but you. Please believe that. I wish I could. Ready with New York, Mr. Reynolds. Shall I put them on? No, no. Can't you tell I'm still on this call? Get off the line. Millie. Yes? Millie, believe me for once, will you? You're imagining things. I love you, baby. There's no one else. I'd just be a good girl till I get back. All right, Frank. Can't blame me. After all, I am your wife. Yeah, yeah, sure. Goodbye, Angel. Operator. Uh, you can go ahead with New York now. Oh, yes, sir. I'm sorry about the interruption, sir. I knew you wanted to talk to your wife in New York, but when I found out your wife was still in Los Angeles... Never mind that. Have you got my New York number? Yes, sir. I'll connect you. Hello? Hello? Diane. Frank. Diane, listen, honey. I haven't much time. You're expecting me day after tomorrow off the train at Penn Station? You you mean you aren't coming? Oh, sure, sure, but listen. I'll be in New York tomorrow morning. Tomorrow? Yeah, I'm flying the rest of the way. Be in early. It'll give us at least a day together, alone. You can meet me at LaGuardia, Flight 8, American Airlines. But, Frank, Frank, you do such strange things. What'll I tell Uncle George and the family? Well, don't tell him anything. That's the idea. Explain to your Uncle George that you're going into town early to shop for a day or two. Oh, we'll skip the whole Long Island tribe and just be together for a day. Sound good? I think so. You think so? It's wonderful, Frank. Yes, you're so clever, darling. I'm a lucky girl to have such a smart husband. (laughs) 
Yes, Frank, the operator has reason to be confused. Because there are two Mrs. Reynolds. One in New York, one in Los Angeles. And you're trembling as you hang up the receiver in Chicago. It becomes even more clear to you now, with the two lives you've been so careful to keep apart, almost meeting accidentally by telephone, how ruinous it would be if Diane and Millicent should ever get together. And the only way out is the desperate way, isn't it? It's too bad, too. Diane is so young, so pretty, so very trusting. At least she always seemed to believe you. But at the airport, you wonder from the moment she meets you if something's wrong. American Airlines Flight 8, arriving at Gate 3. Over here, Frank. American here Airlines. I am. Diane! Hello! Oh, are you excited to see me? Yes. Yes, Frank, I'm excited. Did you drive out? Uh, no, the town car's been Well, right how about a the... taxi? Uh, it's right over here. Oh. Where to, folks? Uh, Harding Arms apartment. It's uh, it's on the east side on 52nd. Harding Arms? I found it last night after you called. Oh. I think you'll like it, Frank. Anyone know I'm here? Not a soul. Uncle George thinks I'm shopping. He's meeting me in the morning at Penn Station to be there when your train comes in. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. And you've... Um, you've really arranged, to be honest? Why not? Just set an early alarm. I'll run out to Newark and get back aboard the train coming from Chicago. You've... Uh, You've planned it all pretty carefully, haven't you, darling? Of course. I wanted to have you all to myself for a change. So? You went to all this trouble. Tickets, the telephone calls, everything. Just to be alone with me for a while. Well, what's wrong with that? And still, you haven't even kissed me yet. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry, no. Diane. No, please, Frank, not now. Well, Diane, what's the matter? I, I try not to believe it, Frank. I try not to listen to Uncle George and the rest of Oh, them. what are they saying now? The same thing. That you married me for my money. But that now that Uncle George has made it impossible for you to get a hold of it, you'll leave me. Well, then what am I doing here, right now? That's what I don't know, Frank. Well, they don't waste any time, do they? They get right to you the minute I'm out of town. Diane, are you sure they don't know I'm here? I told you once, Frank. All right. That better? It's this way every time. They tell me all those... That make me listen to them and then... Then what? Oh, you kiss me like that and I forget all about them. Good. Keep it that way now, huh? I'll, I'll try, Frank. I promise. At a girl. It's very important to me, Diane. This day together. I want it all to be perfect. With the prologue of Quiet Suicide, the Signal Oil Company is bringing you another strange story by The Whistler. At the beginning of this program, you heard me say, in gasoline, it takes extra quality to go farther, and Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. But just what does Signal mean by that word quality? Well, translated into driving language, gasoline quality means quicker starts, faster pickup, Smoother, knock-free power. Now, in order for Signal to give you that kind of performance, the thrill of alert, surging power that puts extra pleasure into driving, today's Signal gasoline has to help your motor run more efficiently. And when your motor runs more efficiently, naturally you get extra mileage. Which explains why more and more folks who insist on performance, as well as those who appreciate mileage, are both switching to Signal. They've discovered that to be sure of the tops in gasoline quality, there are just two things to remember. One, it takes extra quality to go farther. And two, Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. And now back to the whistler. So it's going to be murder, Frank. The only way out of your marriage to Diane that will leave your other marriage in Los Angeles intact. Divorce is out of the question, naturally. 
any notoriety, any publicity on the national press wires, and Millicent might get strange ideas about your uh, business trips to New York. There'd be investigations, bigamy charges, two divorces instead of one, and, of course, the prospect of working for a living when you got out of prison. So it's murder now, a fairly simple kind of murder. The ingredients are all there. Diane, despondent, disillusioned in marriage, a nice, quiet suicide that will rate perhaps two inches of copy in the New York papers. No more. You like the apartment, Frank? Oh, it's wonderful. Three rooms, fireplace, no nosy maids or janitors. Is it everything you wanted? Everything. Even a back entrance. Ah, oh, you couldn't have done better, darling. We're all set. Yes, Frank, all set. With a murder planned for tonight. With your alibi still solid on that eastbound train due tomorrow morning at Penn Station. You were careful back in Chicago, weren't you? Arranging things so it would be almost impossible to check either the plane or train ticket. So no one will be able to say you left the train there and arrived in New York ahead of it. On the way to dinner with Diane, the plan begins to operate. You stop the cab at a drugstore, explain that you want to order a prescription sent up to the apartment and go inside. Yes, sir? Oh, uh, I'd like this filled. Hmm. Twenty-five tablets, luminobarbitine. Yeah, it's my wife. Mm-hmm. Made out to Mrs. Frank Reynolds. Isn't that right? Yes, but I wish she'd come in herself uh, to sign for it. We have to be careful filling prescriptions for sleeping medicine, particularly anything as potent as this. I understand. Well, look, I'd rather not wait anyway. Why not send it up to her? Harding Arms Apartments. She'll be there to sign it for herself. matter, Diane? Don't you like the restaurant? Oh, oh yes, it's perfectly fine. I don't know where we'd get a better dinner. That's not just that. I'm sorry that it has to end. Oh, you mean Uncle George, huh? What? Yes, yes, Uncle George. He'll be with us tomorrow. Yeah, like William the Conqueror. He'll probably know all about this. How? You set the alarm, didn't you? Yes, but... Okay, I'll get up, breeze out to Newark... You can greet me with open arms when I step off the track at Penn Station. You just <laughs> don't know Uncle George. Look over there. Huh? What do you mean? That man who just came in by the hat check stand. What about him? I didn't tell you, Frank, but Uncle George has got his <clears throat> mind set on my divorcing you. He's, he wants to prove to so me. So what? That man over there is one of Uncle George's detectives. How long has this been going on? Since you were here before. Uncle's funny. He even has them follow me sometimes. You? What for? I don't know. Does it really matter, Frank? It matters with me. Did he see us, Diane? I don't think so. Not yet. Let's get out of here. Frank, it's no use. Let me finish my drink. I said let's get out of here. I, uh... I'll mix you a drink at home. Frank? Yeah? Yeah? Anyone see you come in? Not a soul. But it seems silly, you using the back entrance, me coming in the front. Mm. What took you so long? Uh, this. Oh, my prescription. The desk clerk gave it to me. I had to sign for it. Uh, is it right? Yeah. Yeah, it's right. I'll, uh, I'll fix you that drink I promised you. What's the matter? It tastes awfully strong. Did you forget the soda? Ah, you're going soft on me, darling. Down the hatch. Skull. Skull. There. This has been a funny evening. A funny visit. There you go again. What's the matter? Visit. That's an interesting word. Visit. Look, darling. My husband's visiting me for a few days. Nice to see you, dear. Nice to look across the room and find you there. You're in a strange mood tonight. No. Not strange, really. Just devoted. And maybe a little disappointed. Love does a lot of funny things, you know. Tops up your eyes and your ears. 
keeps you believing in someone no matter what people tell you. You're just tired, Diane. Yes. Yes, I guess I am. Tired of secret meetings with my own husband. Tired of lying to Uncle George, trying to defend you when I... When you what? There is another woman, isn't there, Frank? In Los Angeles. Don't be silly. It's like a movie. Sometimes, when I close my eyes and try to sleep, I see you getting off the train, meeting a smart-looking blonde in a red convertible. You better get those ideas out of your head. Do you mind if I stretch out a little? Not at all. I... I really don't think you're so terrible, darling. I... I just love you. Sure. Men think women don't know. They think they don't even suspect a little bit. But they do. They do, Frank. They do. Yes, Frank, that sleeping medicine works fast. You watch the clock, 7.30, 8, 9, and then finally reach for her wrist and feel her pulse. There's nothing there now. Nothing. It takes a few minutes more to check the room, tidy it up, get rid of the cigarette butts that aren't stained with lipstick, wipe off fingerprints, scrape the druggist label off the bottle of sleeping pills, and then quietly... You let yourself out the door and hurry toward the back service stairs, and then... Is that the floor? Yes, sir. Mrs. Reynolds' apartment is 20B, around the corner near the rear stairway. Are you sure she's here? Yes, she came in an hour or so ago. Alone? Yes, sir, alone. Uh, Shall I wait? Uh, Stand by a minute. I'll see if she'll talk to me for a while. I'll wait. It's the detective, Frank, coming from the elevator. You're trapped with a choice of meeting him or running back down to the lobby. It's then that you feel the key in your hand. The apartment, yeah. There's no time to think, Frank. You hold your breath, press back against the wall behind the door, and then... She must be in there, sir. There's only one way out of the building at this time of night. Yeah, open it up. That's it. Mrs. Reynolds! You take the only chance you have, Frank. As they go in, you slide around the door in the darkness and then out into the hall. Here, what's this? Get the light. Mrs. Re- Mrs. Reynolds! <laughs> You aren't conscious of time now, Frank. Maybe it's an hour, maybe two since that awful moment in the apartment. But things are beginning to settle down now as you sit in the dim railroad station in Newark, waiting for that train of yours to pull in. You settle back against the bench, vaguely aware of the smell of the oiled wood floors, and then the boards creak slightly as someone moves toward you in the darkness. Got a light, buddy? What? Oh. Oh, yeah. Uh, here you are. Thanks. Yeah, thanks very much. Oh, uh, mind if I keep these? Hmm? Oh, no. Go ahead. Oh. Dull hour, three in the morning. Waiting for a train? Yeah, yeah. It's a funny thing, guy sitting in this drab station waiting for the train from Chicago at this hour. Listen, I... Yes, sir? Odd thing. You know, you could grab a taxi outside and get to New York in an hour. Still, you're waiting here. Why? Look, you can figure that out for yourself. Sit down, Mr. Reynolds. How did you... My my name... It was printed on that match folder you handed me. What do you want? I want you to help me decide whether your wife's death was suicide or murder. She... She's dead? Yeah. 
after talking to her uncle, I decided to drop over here and see if you really were on the train. Oh, well, listen, I can explain about that. Mm -hmm. I... You can save all that for later. I'm Pearson, Mr. Reynolds, New York homicide. Why don't we skip the train and start back to New York right now? They're waiting for us back at your apartment. <laughs> So now you're faced with it, Frank. Your big alibi, the keystone in your whole plan, is gone. Once or twice on the way back to the apartment, you almost decide to get it over with. To tell Pearson the whole truth and avoid the dread questioning you know is sure to come. But somehow you're not quite ready to give up. And when you finally walk into the apartment to face Diane's Uncle George, you get an idea of a way to bluff it through. I tell you, this man's a murderer, Pearson. Just a minute, Mr. Brecken. It's just a moment. Let me handle it. I told you. I told you. I can explain everything. All right, you'll have a chance to, but let me start out, huh? Now, uh, it seems you're on your way to New York on the train. You switched to a plane somewhere without telling anyone but your wife. Figure you can intercept the same train a day or so later, give yourself a solid alibi. There's no use denying it, Frank. Who's denying it? What? You mean you admit it? Most of it. Just one word I don't like. Alibi. Oh, it's true about the train. I set it up by telephone from Chicago. You had a good reason, of course. A very good reason. What are you talking about? You, Uncle George. You've never given us a minute's peace. Sticking your nose into our business, trying to poison Diane's mind against me. That's why I did it, Pearson. I wanted that day together. Just Diane and I, my wife, the two of us, by ourselves. Oh, that's ridiculous. I was forced into it, Lieutenant. Ask him about the private detective. Yeah. We go out for a quiet little dinner. At 7 o'clock last night, one of his bloodhounds follows us into the Shamrock Club. We know all about that. So what happened after you got home? I told her. She either forgets Uncle George or I was through. She broke down. She she got hysterical. Well, I walked out. I, I paced the streets for a while, and then I went over to Newark. You didn't come back here? No. I see. Mr. Kittredge, will you step in here, please? Kittredge? Yes. A druggist, Mr. Reynolds. I want you to meet him. Yes, Lieutenant. Oh, uh... This is Mr. Reynolds, Mr. Kittredge. Do you, uh... uh... Yes, sir. That's the man who ordered the prescription. Oh, of course. If you thought hard enough, Mr. Kittredge. You remember I told you that prescription was for my wife. Then why did you order it? Because she asked me to on the way to dinner. And she gave you a prescription made out by a doctor in Los Angeles? Uh, Los Angeles? Why, I can't. Yes, uh, You don't know how a Los Angeles doctor could prescribe pills for your wife when she's never been there. Well, neither do I. There's something else, Mr. Reynolds. I've been in the homicide division for eight years now. I guess I've investigated a hundred suicides, and a lot of them women. You know something, Mr. Reynolds? I have yet to find one, particularly a woman, who didn't want to have the last word. I don't know what you mean. A suicide note. Your uncle's detective comes in here, finds the girl in the bed, a bottle of sleeping pills next to her. Now, does it seem logical she'd set up a thing like that without doing the one thing they all do? I told you. She was despondent. She wasn't thinking straight when I left her. Yeah, that's what you say. I say she went to bed with every intention of getting up. All right, come on, Reynolds. You can get in touch with your lawyer on the way to head. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. I didn't do anything, Lieutenant. You've got to believe skip me. It, I... Skip it. I've got no time for that. Uh, just a minute, Lieutenant. Huh? I, I just can't take this on myself. What I feel personally and what is just... Are two different things, I guess. Uh, Diane was in Los Angeles a month ago. What? You mean she well, was? Well, that's interesting. I, I should have told you before, I suppose, but... Oh, think nothing of it. And I suppose you have the suicide note tucked up your sleeve? Well, I, uh, I do have one, as a matter of fact. An old one. You see, uh, Diane did try to kill herself just last month. And that's why I've been having her follow. Well, Reynolds, I guess I was wrong. Yeah, well, we all make mistakes once in a while. I'm sorry. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, a question. How long has it been since you had your fan belt and radiator hose checked for looseness or wear? Well, if you're like most drivers, the chances are you never even give these items a thought. But independent signal dealers, being practical automobile men, have not only thought of them, but they're doing something about it. 
Right now, they're offering a free checkup of both your fan belt and radiator hose. You'll probably find everything's okay, in which case you'll feel better to know it. But if they should discover that either your fan belt or radiator hose needs replacing, then in most cases they can do that while you wait. And you'll be glad you had attended to before more serious trouble develops. This free checkup of your fan belt and radiator hose, incidentally, is typical of the more thorough, more conscientious attention cars get at signal service stations. The reason? Each signal dealer owns his own business and naturally has a more personal interest in keeping your goodwill. And now back to the whistler. <laughs> So it's over now, Frank. A few more questions and you'll be released. Free of suspicion that you murdered Diane, wife number one. Free to go back to Los Angeles and someone they know nothing about, Millicent, wife number two. And it's ironic that Diane's Uncle George came through with the one statement that could save you. Yes, you were as surprised as Lieutenant Pearson to hear that Diane had actually gone to Los Angeles. And you realize now that she knew the truth about Millicent that if you'd left her alone, she might have tried suicide a second time, successfully. You're going to be careful now, Frank. No missteps, no false moves, taking the cue from the lieutenant. Yeah, this is a tough business I'm in, Reynolds. You've got to play hunches, you know. Yeah. I came into the room tonight and I took a look around. I see there isn't a note. Say to myself, mm, this lady went to bed figuring she'd be up and going the next day. Intent, you know. Yeah, it's pretty important stuff. I understand, lieutenant. Yeah, I was trained to look for intent above everything else. Well, sometimes you go wrong, though, just like now. Sometimes. Well, now. What do you know about that? Intent, you know. That's what they're going to ask me, Reynolds. What was in the little lady's mind? The clock. I don't understand it. She... I don't blame you. Now, why do you suppose she set that alarm clock? I'll tell you why. She expected it to wake her up. She expected to be alive right now. You know, I guess we'll just have to start the questions all over again. That clock's a little noisy for a nice, quiet suicide. That whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Wednesday night at this same time, brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil, and fine quality automotive accessories. Signal has asked me to remind you, to get the most driving pleasure, drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were Gerald Moore and Lorette Philbrand. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen with story by Robert Eisenbach and Jackson Gillis and music by Wilbur Hatch and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Next Wednesday, for a full hour of mystery over most of these stations, tune in half hour earlier. Enjoy The Saint as well as The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.